O Lord my God, Thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and glory, who coverest Thyself with light as with the garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever. The waters stood above the mountains at thy rebuke, they fled. At the voice of thy thunder, they hasted away. They go down by the valley unto the place which thou hast founded for them. He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man that he may bring forth food out of the earth and wine that maketh glad the heart of man and oil to make his face to shine and bread which strengtheneth man's heart. The trees of the Lord are full of sap, where the birds make their nests. As for the stork, the fir trees are her house. Thou makest darkness, and it is night, wherein all the beasts of the forest do creep forth. O Lord, how manifold are thy works! The earth is full of thy riches. So is this great and wide sea, wherein are things creeping innumerable. There go the ships, there is that Leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein. He looketh on the earth, and it trembleth. He toucheth the hills, and they smoke. I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will be glad. In the Lord, God is good, and all the time, Psalm 100, verse 5, for the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. And I usually say, when God blesses us, He's good. When He punishes us, come on, tell me, He's good. When he answers your prayer, come on, he's good. When he says aloud, no, he's good. Mm -hmm. There's nothing God does that's not good. Nobody said amen. amen. <laughs> Psalm 145, verse 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways, all, and holy in all his works, which means God cannot do anything wrong. Come on, say amen for God. Amen. Now, we are specialists in doing wrong. God cannot do anything wrong. So when you and I get angry with God, we are suffering from temporary insanity. How do you get angry with a God who only specializes in that which is good? Good evening, everyone. How are you? I thought of you today and I prayed for you. For those of you who provide transportation, I've been asking God to bless you. Bless your cars. I've asked God to put mechanical eternal life into your car. I'm not joking. That your car will run and run and run and that God will fulfill His promise for you. In Malachi 3 verse 11, I will rebuke the devourer from your engine. And I've asked God, anyone in that car should be safe. If there's an accident, I told God, let the occupants be safe in those cars. Thank you for taking the trouble to come and pick me up and take me back. I do not take it for granted. Who's with us this evening? You're not a Seventh-day Adventist. You are here for the very first time. May I see your hand? First time. You're not. Ah. Father in heaven. Bless that sister and bring her back tomorrow. I'm waiting for the church to say something. Amen. What's wrong with you? Anybody else? Father, bless that sister. Bless this one. Anybody else? For those of you online, you're, ad you're not Adventists. Father in heaven, bless our guests online. We thank you for your presence. All right. Our subject for this evening, basic requirements. What did I say? What was our subject last night? What? 
What was our subject the night before? What was our subject the night before? Very good. I gave you all an A for Adventists. Okay. Before I get into the message, remember, let me double check to turn your phones off. I have some friends who think I'm opposed to technology. I'm not opposed to technology. But let me tell you this. This cannot ring in the church. Is this microphone working? <laughs> this cannot ring in the church and disturb God. This does not need to be plugged in. It comes fully powered. It stays fully powered. This does not come with advertisements. This doesn't have WhatsApp to distract you. Or your picture gallery that contains a picture of your friend's girlfriend. Are you with me? <laughs> this doesn't have that. This comes with temptations. So if the sermon is boring, you may cut the preacher off by going to this. If you don't need this, put it away and pick up one of these. Can you say amen? Mm -hmm. But if you use this, okay, make sure it does not ring. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say what? Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And favor number three, think. Isaiah 1 18, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Reason together. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, someone equal with yourself. It was he who said, I am the resurrection and the life. It was he who said, I and my Father are one. It was he who said on the cross, it is finished. And it was he who said, I will come again. And Father, it was he who said, let there be light. In that name, dear God, I come to you. And I ask you first, forgive us if we've offended you, dear God, particularly me. Cleanse us, dear God, by the application of the blood of your Son, which is his life. With that cleansing, give us a mind that hates sin. Give us power to resist. Father in heaven, put your words in my mouth. Restrain my carnal nature, which loves attention. Let the Spirit instruct me, say this or do not say that. And when he speaks, grant me the humility to listen. Bless all those who have come, particularly our guests online and in person. Touch them, Father, with a degree of divine intimacy. Now, God, bless this country. Bless the leaders, Father, because the Bible is very clear. There is no power but of God. Every position of power, that power comes from God. Bless them. Direct them in all the deliberations, dear God, that the decisions they make will not hinder the advance of the gospel. But there are many countries represented by those watching. Bless those countries too as well. In particular, bless your people in those countries. Now, dear God, as I make my weak, stumbling human effort to deliver divine truth, help me, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. What's our subject? Basic requirements, Genesis 2, 16 and 17. As long as I live, I'll find reason to begin the sermon with Genesis 2, 16 and 17. From the King James Version, the Bible says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. That's as clear as day. Thou shalt not eat of it. Don't do it. Are you with me? 
Parents, you are familiar with this statement. You use it with your children. Don't do that. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Death is the end of every favor God could ever bestow on a human being, including up to and including life. You're dead. You're not entitled to one breath, one blink of an eye, one functioning mitochondrion dead because of sin. We know Adam and Eve sinned. Let's go to verse 7 of Genesis 3. Well, before we go to, let's go to verse 9 of Genesis 3. Our subject, basic requirements. By the way, it's uh, eight minutes after 7. I'll release you by, hopefully, 7.45. Hopefully, that's the key word. Do you have verse 9 of Genesis 3? And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Pause. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Question for you, did God know where Adam was, yes or no? Yes, but God is so gracious, God gives you and me an opportunity to tell him what we did. In other words, as we say in the United States, he gives us a chance to come clean. Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He had a consciousness he had done wrong. Let me say that again. Adam had a consciousness of wrongdoing. And he said, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? Did you do what I told you not to do? In other words, did you disobey? And I will preach obedience and disobedience as long as I live because the elements of the gospel are simple. The problem is sin. What is sin? Disobedience. I was talking to a friend of mine today. He's probably seated somewhere. And we're talking about Zulus and Endebele and Kosa. Did I say it probably? Kosa. And, uh, you know, Maasai and you name tribes. They all have the same culture. Sin. There's a Zulu version. There's a Matabele version. There's a Shauna version. There's a Sutu version, but they all converge at one spot, sin. Then they all require the same solution, Christ. You see, when Adam sinned and Eve sinned, the whole world sinned. I, I lost you. It's too early for me to lose you. The whole world sinned, which means the culture of the world is sin. I don't care if your pastor is white or black. Your problem is sin. And God said, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it? Adam knew he had sinned. Let's go to verse 17. Of Genesis 3, our subject, basic requirements. And unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. God bless all wives. Come on, say amen for wives. Amen. But your wife is not God. God bless all husbands. But your husband's voice is not the voice of God, necessarily. I'm not preaching rebellion. <laughs> I'm simply saying, you cannot have two gods. Your, your spouse and God. There's one God. So God said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. And has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Now, let's reason together. If sin brought the curse, what lifts the curse? You're speaking so softly, I can't hear you. If sin brought the curse, how do you remove the curse? Remove sin. And the curse goes. I 
I often say, people do not die of cancer, they die of sin. In the new world, when there's no sin, there'll be no death. Sin, death came because of sin. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. Romans 5, verse 12, Ezekiel 18, verse 4, and verse 20, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Romans 6, 26, the wages of 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Remove sin and death goes. That's why we read in Revelation 22, verse 3, there shall be no more curse in the new world. Why? Because there shall be no more sin. And I say again, the problem of this world is sin. Remove sin and the curse goes. That's why Galatians 3 verse 13 tells us Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law because he took it and he removed it from us. Let's look at verse 7 and verse 21 of Genesis 3. What's our subject? Basic requirements. And they're very basic. A lot of preachers make the gospel complicated. It is not. You know why I know the gospel is simple? Because the Bible says the Lord is not willing that any should perish. And most people are not highly educated. Then if God desires to serve all, to save all, all must understand the basics of the gospel. Therefore, the gospel is simple. The problem is sin. You can't save yourself. You need a savior, but you must feel the need for that savior. Verse 7 of Genesis 3. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. That's verse 7. Look at verse 21. And to Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Now, let's reason together. If you're not reasonable, you cannot understand the Bible. You see, the Bible is not a book of proof. Where there's proof, there's no need for faith. Am I, are you with me? The Bible is a book of evidence. Then you examine the evidence honestly, reasonably, and if you do that, the Spirit will point you in the direction of the evidence. All the evidence of the Bible is the seventh day is the Sabbath. The fact that most of the world observes Sunday tells me they do not come to the Word of God reasonably. Well, most, some are just simply ignorant. All right. In verse 21, the Bible says, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. We have in this passage the picture of God removing the fig leaves. Even though it is not mentioned, he did that. But the Bible tells us he did it, and we'll discover how. He removes the leaves and replaces them with the coats of skin, symbolizing the righteous life of Jesus Christ. Now, how does the Bible tell us that God removed the aprons? Let us look at an acted parable. An acted parable is one that's not simply spoken, but it demonstrates activity. Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah 3, we read from verse 1. Our subject, basic requirements. And then we have an anointing at the end of the service for a little child. So this is a good service. We preach about sin and removal of sin, then we have an anointing. What book did I say? Zechariah. What chapter? Three. Reading from what verse? One. Let me pray again. Father in heaven, continue to be with me, dear God, and slow me down. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And he showed me, now he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. We have Joshua representing God's people. The angel of the Lord and we have Satan trying to oppose, resist, be adversarial to Joshua or the church. Now, and the Lord said unto Satan, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? By the way, sin is a fire from which only Christ can pluck you. 
you cannot deliver yourself from sin. It's a brand plucked by someone else. If Christ does not pluck you and me from the fires of sin, we'll burn and cease to exist. Verse 3. Keep Genesis 3, 7 in your mind. And verse 21 of Genesis 3. Now Joshua was clothed how? With filthy garments and stood before the Lord. Now we have Joshua in filthy garments. What were Adam and Eve clothed in before Christ came to them? Filthy garments. Now read verse 4. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, What? Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, What? Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and will clothe thee with what? Change of raiment. We have here the picture of what happened in Eden. Christ removed the aprons of leaves, filthy garments, and replaced them with a new raiment, meaning, of course, his righteous life. But salvation is forced on no one. What does that tell you about Adam and Eve? They had to. Come on. They had to choose. Now, listen to 1 John 1 verse 9. Don't go, just listen. Well, no, say it with me. If we, come on, confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Now, forgiveness is an act with, with, that expresses action and reaction. There's a removing of sin and a replacement with the righteousness of Christ. Mm -hmm. It's instant. There's no gap between the two. The instant sin is removed, it is replaced by the righteous life of Christ. If we confess our sins, not if God confesses our sins for us. You see, you must want this. You must want to be sin free. I must want to be victorious. Because what people really want, they go after. We see that in romance all the time. Come on, say amen. If we confess our sins, Adam and Eve must have confessed their sins to God. A basic requirement. Confession of sin. But confession of sin is only component of repentance. What is repentance? It's a turning away from a previous life. You were going south with the devil, now you're going north with Jesus. Repentance. But repentance involves confession because you must repent of what you are aware of having done wrong. So where you see confession, you see repentance. Where you see repentance, you see confession. Listen to the preaching of John the Baptist who came to prepare the way for Christ. Matthew 3, reading from verse 1. Matthew 3, reading from verse 1, 23 minutes after 7. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying what? Repent ye why, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What did John the Baptist preach? Repent. Go to the next chapter, Matthew 4. Let's read verse 17. If you have my version, read it with me. From that time began Jesus to what? Preach and to say what? Repent. Why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What did Jesus preach? Come on, tell me. Repent. Because the problem is sin. Does Jesus want you to work? Yes or no? Yes. That's why he tells us in the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall... By the way, the command to rest is also a command to work. Am I talking to myself? The command to rest also has a command to work. So if you're out of work, go to God and tell him, you said work. I provide a job. 
that does not require Sabbath work. Say amen loudly. Amen. It was weak, but I'll take it. Amen. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let's go to Mark chapter 6. Mark 6. Let's read for verse 7. Do you have Mark 6? Verse 7. And when he had called unto him the twelve, he began to send them forth by two and two and give them power over unclean spirits. Read verse 12 for me. What does that say? And they went out and preached everywhere that... <laughs> Why? Because the problem, come on, talk to me, is sin. Now, I said earlier, does God want you to work? Yes, but he did not preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Get a job. Because your problem is not joblessness. Let me say it differently. Your problem that may endanger your eternal life is not the fact that you're unemployed. It's sin. Christ didn't say, get married. The kingdom of God is at hand. No one goes to hell because he could not find a wife or she couldn't find a husband. Are you with me? We go to hell because of sin. You listen to modern preachers, particularly on television, you get the impression that your problem is poverty. Now, I will never glorify poverty. But if poverty is sin, Jesus was a big sinner. Are you following me? Why? He was poor. Let me say it again before people write this church and say, never bring this man back again. I am not glorifying poverty. I am saying it is not poverty that takes you to hell. It is sin. It is the fact you're living with a man that's not your husband. While you make a million rand a week, well employed. That's what Jesus said. What? Repent. What's our subject? Basic requirement. There's something you're doing you need to stop. Tonight. Let's go to Laodicean church. The last phase of the church's history, Revelation chapter 3. We are Laodicea, or we are in that area, of that era of the church's history. It began in Ephesus, now we are in Laodicea. There isn't an eighth church, so something has to happen in Laodicea. Let's read verse 19 of Revelation 3. This is a message to Laodicea. This is a message to Santon. And every church family represented by those watching online. Read verse 19 for me. What does that say? As many I love, as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and who said that? Jesus. Now, in other words, let's bring Christ from 2,000 years ago and bring him to this day in Laodicea. He is telling Santon, repent. Notice what the word says, be zealous. You know, there's a half-hearted way to do some things. If your child is failing school, you may say, come on, put your heart into your studies. Hmm? Be zealous, Jesus says, put your heart into it and tell me you're sorry. Put your kidneys into it. Put your liver Put your gallbladder, put your lungs, put everything you have and tell me you're sorry. I'll forgive you. And I look at you as though you never did it. Because forgiveness is the removing of that offense. What's our subject? Go to Zechariah, not Zechariah, Jeremiah chapter 3. 7.30. Jeremiah 3, we read 12 and 13. 
Our subject, basic requirements. When you found it, say amen. Let me pray again. Father, please, God, possess my mind, my tongue, my mouth, my everything, that I am simply an instrument you're using. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Go and proclaim these words toward the north. And say what? Return thou backsliding Israel, said the Lord, and I will not cause what? My anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and will not keep anger forever. Now, read verse 13 and keep in mind our subject. Read verse 13. What does that say? Only stop. <laughs> it's not complicated, says God to Israel. Only what? Acknowledge. Come on. Thine iniquities, come on, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God. God said, look, admit you're wrong. That's all. And then make plans to leave that house. Admit this behavior of mine is wrong. And so the verse says, only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God. Admit it. I'll forgive you. Because God does not hold grudges. Somebody say amen. He does not hold grudges. Basic requirement. Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 2. Acts 2, this is one of the most powerful sermons in the entire Bible, perhaps exceeded only by the Sermon on the Mount, preached by Jesus, of course. No one could preach more powerfully than Christ. Eloi said the second greatest teacher in the Bible was Paul, second greatest. You know who the greatest is? Jesus. Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost. He comes to a pause in the sermon, verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? We've been hearing this man since Sunday night in Santon. What shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, now you read it. Stop. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Finish the verse. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, what shall you receive? Why is it a gift? You cannot manufacture the Holy Ghost. I feel I'm speaking to myself. You cannot produce the Holy Ghost. You cannot manufacture the Holy Ghost. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But go to Romans chapter 8. Read verse 9. Romans 8 verse 9. Our subject, basic requirements. 27 minutes to 8. Read with me, but ye are not in the flesh, if so be that the Spirit of Christ dwell in you. Finish that verse. Now, if any man, come on, have not, he is. If you do not have the Spirit of Christ or the Spirit of God, you do not belong to God. Now, the Bible says, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, whose presence in your life is evidence you're a child of God. Let me amend my remarks. Whose controlling presence in your life is evidence? Because the Holy Spirit, He restrains some people, He convicts others. Let me change that. He restrains and convicts some, others, He just restrains them. If your probation has closed, the Holy Ghost just restrains you. Conviction is useless. Are you with me? 
He just restrains you from doing all the evil you can do. But if you're a child of God, he convicts you. No, don't do that. And he restrains you. Repent. Now, did Jesus take our nature? Yes or no? Yes. I will give you a quotation from Ella White. You must listen to it very carefully. Before I give it to you, answer some questions for me. Was Jesus baptized? Yes. Baptism is for whom? Sinners. <laughs> now, Jesus never sinned. And I have to say that over and over because the carnal nature will lead you to say that I said Jesus sinned. He never sinned, but he did, he did what? He took. And we're told in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, he took our sins into his body. Only sinners are baptized. Question for you. Did Jesus pray? Praying is for whom? Sinners. Did Jesus live by faith? Living by faith is for whom? Sinners. Come on now. Take a deep breath. Did Jesus die? Dying is for whom? Sinners. <laughs> now here comes the question. Did Jesus repent of sins? Now don't catch laryngitis on me. Did Jesus repent of sins? Did Jesus die because of sin? Did Jesus repent of sins? We need to fill the baptismal pool and baptize all that side over there all over again. <laughs> Write down this quotation. Manuscript Releases, Volume 21, page 196, paragraph 2. I'll give you some time to write it down, if you remember what I said. <laughs> Manuscript Releases. Do you have that? That's MR. Manuscript Releases. Volume 21, page 196, paragraph 2. Ellen White is commenting on the baptism of Christ. When Christ told John, suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness, because John the Baptist did not want to baptize Christ, because he knew Christ was who he was. Christ said, do it. Because we must fulfill all righteousness. Now, listen to Ellen White. In fulfilling all righteousness, Jesus did not bring righteousness to an end. He fulfilled all the requirements of God in repentance, faith, and baptism, the steps of, in grace of genuine conversion. Christ went through the steps of conversion which he didn't need. Are you following me? Why did he go through that? Come on. For us. For us. Did Christ need baptism? Answer me quickly. Why did he do it? For us. He fulfilled all the requirements of God in repentance, faith, baptism, the steps in grace, in genuine conversion. So when you go to God and you repent, you say, Father, I repent in the strength of the repentance of Jesus Christ. I am baptized in the baptism of Jesus Christ. He died for sins he never committed. He repented of sins he never committed. But he took our place. Consequently, he had to go through the steps. And because he took our place, the Father had to do to him what the Father should have done to us. So when he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We should have uttered that cry. Repent. Basic requirement in preparation to meet thy God. Because he's coming. Let me be kind as I say this. We are so busy surviving from day to day, we forget 
that Christ is coming back. We literally forget. There's a sermon I preach called Miles and Inches. You may call it kilometers and something. Here's what I meant to say by that message. This life is this long. Are you with me? Eternal life is this long. We focus all our energies on this and pay no attention to this. Then we sing, I'm on my way to the kingdom. God bless that baby. Jesus cried just like that <laughs> because he was a baby. Why are you looking at me like that? I said Jesus cried just like that. Well, let me not get into that. My brothers and sisters, Christ is coming back. More surely than February is two weeks away. Are we getting ready to meet our God? Only one thing can prevent you from meeting your God. Tell me what that is. Let's repent tonight. Don't think about it. Repent tonight. You already know you're wrong. It has been bothering you. You've cried. You ask this person, pray for me. That person, pray for you. You will not make the step to repent. You realize repentance provides a sense of freedom. Tonight, I'm asking you and me, if there's something of which we need to repent, let's do it tonight. If you're in an illegal relationship, break it off tonight. You don't know what an illegal relationship is? Let me tell you. Be not an equally yoked together. Come on. We don't believe. Send a text to that man tonight. And tell him this has to stop. Send a text to that woman who has nice hips and lips. And tell her this has to stop. Because I've been convicted by God. Not society. Go to your boss and say, I have been skimming off the top. You know what skimming off the top is? I admit my fault. I'm prepared to be fired or if you allow me to make restitution. Someone came to me a few years ago. Well, wrote me. I did it. The person had done exactly that. What do I do? Go and tell the boss what you've done. Let God work on his heart. The person went and confessed. I have taken. The boss said, I am deeply disappointed. But I will not fire you. Because you've, de you've determined to make restitution. Repent. Basic requirement. How many of you will say, Lord, thank you for this message that has convicted my heart. Can I see your hand? Stand up with you. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Quietly. Dear God, seated in the pews are sinners. Standing in the pulpit is a sinner. We both need your grace, your forgiveness, your cleansing. As Eloi tells us, the most difficult sin day God for you to deal with is not eating meat. It's pride. Dear God, we confess what we've done wrong to you. We repent in the spirit of Jesus Christ. Forgive us, dear God. Please. We don't know what will happen during the night. But we want our heads resting on those pillows with peace, knowing all is right between me and my God. And while heads are bowed, 
and eyes are closed. Any man, any woman who has something to say to God, Father, I've been doing this thing. I know it has hurt you. It has embarrassed you. It has dis I have been doing this, and tonight I repent. If I just spoke to you, come. Come. If I just spoke to you, come. And I'm waiting for you. God bless you, my brother. God bless you. God always makes one person move first to make the others move. Come. Father, there's something I've been doing. I'm not confused. I know I'm wrong. Wrong. Tonight, I'm sorry to God. Forgive me. Come. You're not coming to me. You're coming in response to the voice of Christ through a human agent. Father, I know this thing is wrong. I don't need any more Bible studies. It's wrong. But I've done it. I'm sorry. Come. I've got to leave this relationship, God, before I lose my salvation. Come. Somebody else come. Sixty seconds, I wait for the next person to come. Don't wait for tomorrow night's sermon to repent. Come now. I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry. Come. I know I'm wrong. Come, 50 seconds. God bless you, my brother. God bless you. I mean that sincerely. 40 seconds. I know I'm wrong. Even I, where I'm standing right now, I'm bothered because I know I ought to move. I'm bothered. 30 seconds. Come. Twenty seconds. Come. Fifteen seconds. Ten. Five. Four. Three. Two, one, I'm going to pray. If you're physically able, kneel with me. Dear God, we're sorry. We've caused the devil to stick his finger in your face, laughing at you. All the evil spirits have laughed at you as they pointed to us, telling you they cannot conquer sin. Forgive us, God, for subjecting you to universal embarrassment. We're sorry, Father. Forgive us, dear God. You do not hold grudges. Right as we kneel in your presence, apply the blood of your son, and the blood is merely a symbol for his life, his right. Apply that life to us. Remove the fig leaves, Father, and cover us with your son's life, his righteous life, his obedient life. In the name of Jesus Christ, their God, Put into our hearts, at the very level of our genes, a hatred for sin. And just a love for doing what's right. Why? Because it is right. If there's someone in a relationship that is contrary to being not equally yoked together with unbelievers, give that person the moral power to break it off. Whatever other thing we're doing that has us in a cell of sin, Father, set us free tonight. 
and just leave this church a different person. And so God, do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Cleanse us and give us a taste for right doing. Bless your people bowing in your presence, Father. Somehow let them sense you have wrapped your arms around them. You are happy for this occasion. Ah, Father, hug them to your bosom, dear God. They may look at them with pride. Now you can point your finger in the devil's face and say, See, covered by the blood of Christ. Hear this humble prayer, Father. Not only for us bowing in your presence, but for those online repenting right now. When you come, save us, God, until that day. Preserve us tonight in the path of right doing. In Jesus' name I pray. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Stand with me. Let's sing one chorus of, Would you be free from the burden of sin? Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood, would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is, come on, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is, yes, mm -hmm. wonder working power. Say amen for God. Amen. Say amen for salvation. Amen. Say amen for Calvary. Amen. Say amen for one another. Because we need one another. God arranged it. He arranged the church. And it's good to look around and see that person, this person understands me because we are struggling together, but we want to encourage one another together. Pastor, we want to get right into the... Uh, you may be seated, please.